many times to the two musicians are being just give them a hand, give them a hand for this meeting. It's a great moment for me both to extend the global forum, and it's also a mind of a really good feeling to see you all here around. My name is Adrian Schmid, I'm the president of the Peace and Open Foundation, and I'm happy to have you here. And that the responsible for the Open Host Committee is also a one beautiful moment together with you. When I go back to the musicians now, I mean, which would like to. Uh, the drums were kind of like a, a thunderstorm, you know, a worldwide thunderstorm. It is also a sign in this globally so challenging time worldwide. And when I look back and I see what's going on in Ukraine, the war in Ukraine, it is really a horrible situation. Then I see that by the pandemic, it's not over yet at this moment. I'm happy to have you here all over the world. Some of the people they couldn't arrive because of this. Always still going on pandemic. And the climate change is disturbing. Of course, the miniature being supplied at the most, at this moment, most disturbing me point is the right wing populist. Anyway, you see them here. And for me, and for me, this is a combination of these five risks that I just uh, told you before. That worries me. I mean, this is the combination of these risks together. And considering for a moment the man with his hands just folded. You see him? And of course, you know him. And I'm happy to have some people from Hungary here under us. And the Hitler or from Hungary is probably no longer, I would say that and underline that. It's not longer full democracy according to the EU Parliament, just a couple of days before. Orban, violent facing human rights, supports the Russian President Putin. You can see this guy also here on this picture. And I would say maybe leave, maybe at this moment, this outside of the world. This is not part of the world. But we have, of course, we have another world. Just not extreme maybe. When I consider the musician, I said just in the beginning, the drums were representing like a thunderstorm. And the so called Schweizer Urgal, this was this little instrument all being played for us. This Schweizer Urgal sounds for me so lovely. It's a so called Schweizer Urgal, and it's also a hopeful sound. I would say it's a hopeful one, it's completely different, completely different other world than these five guys we just saw a couple of minutes before. The sound is of joy, expression of music permission in Switzerland. I would say that you are invited all over the world, and we wanted to give you also the possibility of hearing something about this musical tradition in Switzerland. And I'm happy, all the other day again, thank you for this short moment. Okay. Anyway, and I say maybe in this first beginning part of the conference here in the University of Lucerne, freedom is always this freedom of those who think in different ways. These values were demanded worldwide in the years after the fall of the Berlin Wall. When I think about human rights, when I, was, when I think about what we've done during the last year, what we were fighting for, and when I remember the forum, the global forum we had in Seoul, I'm happy to have you here, the former minister from Seoul, from South Korea. This was the really beginning time we started 14 years ago with the global forum worldwide. We went to different places around the world. We went with the hopeful signs in Germany, uh, the situation in Iceland, and of course, Tunisia. Tunisia was a really good experience. It was a strong experience we made concrete in 2015. And it was also a moment we had a little bit of hope, this beginning of the Iraq Spring. But the situation today also is not very good. And I go further on. I have a look at these young ladies. I mean, there's so many smiles in their eyes. There's so much hope when they fight for more democracy worldwide, especially in Algeria, but also in Sudan. In Sudan, there was a big movement. Let's go on to Taiwan. We've been in Taiwan 2019. And it was a great moment to turn around the island with a democracy turn around the island. It was 700 people joining this global conference 
the last time, just three years ago, and of course, the situation we know now in Ukraine. When it's been so many times in Ukraine, work there and understand and we help them just then. I have to say that, as I said in the beginning, the situation is horrible, and it's also hope in Ukraine. As we join three of us, three of the board of the member of the three board members of the Swiss Democracy were invited to join the Ukraine conference in Lugano. And I was really happy. After two days, I saw what's going on. I saw so many people discussing. There were so many people trying to find solutions. And at this moment, I would very welcome at, uh, this conference from Ukraine. Since so in with uh, Elena, especially today, she will be in her air conference. These people, if this image touch me, there are also motivation for us when I can say that for our partner, Democracy International in Germany, in Colombia. I would say thanks, very thanks, big thank you to Andreas. Müller, Director of Democracy International, like a team. There were so many people working for this conference. You got the program. 50 sides, 50 sides, 50 pages of this program. This was a lot of work, and there were so many people worked for this program. So I would like to thank you. And I think give them just a hand to the people from the team of Andreas Müller. I can't say all the names of these 20 people. I'm mean, sorry about that. But anyway, say also thank you to Daniel Schilly, please, uh, and Andreas Kimi, and the many members of the board of the Swiss Democracy Foundation. I think if the maybe just one time, uh, thank you to very much. Well, this is all the way now we're trying to get here to turn to the tent all night away from here from one of my regular democracy. Uh, that's uh, the program we have here about 500 people, not everybody could join today. A lot of people are coming tomorrow. There are about 30 workshops we organized, and it brings together 500 people from 51 countries, 51 countries, and they will uh, discuss or key issues here in the third. I'm very, very grateful to this. I'm really honored to have you all here. I would say I'm happy and a little much taller about this situation. Anyway, grateful. But also, I would go to the uh, next step. I would also welcome all the partners. We have four partners to help the finance program. I mean, everybody who we can share, who can uh, play a program here that you don't have to pay for that. That's possible because we have more than 40 partners and I financed also complete. It's free for you of charge. And I would also thanks to the local committee from six former presidents of the city council of the Stadt Rat from Luzern. They are all here. There are six different parties. I will say that that's something special. It's really something special. We think we find together from the left wing side. To the right wing side. They are all six parties from the city parliament are uh, here and uh, work to find together. That's also a part I really would say it's a strong sign. It's really a strong sign that you could find that and a sign that the cooperation from right to left is possible in Lucerne. But also in my vote, uh, Switzerland, I have to say, I hope, oh, there must be see also in Switzerland is under pressure. We here. Later, here in Berlin, President of Switzerland, I should also talk about this situation. Maybe some of you should join the tour with both uh, launch on board of the Lucerne political scientists and led a quasi day in an increasing tour. Towards, um, I would say thanks also to Gold Launch. I will come back to this in my closing remarks today. Now we are now facing five exciting days. You find all the program details here. You got it here. And Stephanie Bosset, she is the director of the Swiss Democracy Foundation, will then lead us through the opening of the Global Forum 2022. Let me close this uh, welcome address to you, to everybody. With the words of the great, maybe a little bit strange to hear that, I would say that it's the word of the great musician from Kingston, Jamaica, from Bob Marley. Who knows Bob Marley? So Bob Marley, and he said in one of his songs, stand up, 
and don't forget the fight. It's a fight today, I would say that. It's a fight between two systems, and we have to do this fight. I didn't say, like Kumar said, stand up and never give up the fight. I would say, for more democracy and for better democracy, go by. And now, I vote, go by and now. Thank you to everybody. Thanks to everybody for joining the World Life Conference here. Stephanie, you have the floor. We're waiting for the Super. Thank you, Adrian, for this dedicated welcome and introduction. And thank you also for your work because many details of this global forum bear your signature. Thank you. Then, yeah, that's Then a very warm welcome also from my side. And Stephanie, as you already heard, I will accompany you through the evening today, and I am looking very much forward to that. A small technical instruction. You have uh, on the headphones, you have a, an English and a German translation both on channel one. So it will switch when someone is speaking German or English. I am very happy to be here, dear ladies and gentlemen. It's Really, it's really good to see that after all this preparation, the program um, which was created on paper is filling up with life and faces. Some of you are all have already attended a global forum. For some of you, maybe it is a first. And the global forum, it has a history. We will hear about that in a minute. The forum is not one of these conferences where you just sit in and consume. But the global forum is a very open and a very has a very open and democratic character. It lives from contributions, from co-thinking, from co-investment and co-creation. Each and every one of you already shaped the forum in your own way, or will do it in the next few days. This evening today is actually your last opportunity to sit back and listen before the work starts tomorrow. So I suggest benefit from listening and do celebrate it because listening is a very, very important part of a democracy. The many speakers of this evening and their different perspectives on democracy, on direct democracy are a symbol for the very broad variety of the global forum. We are starting with four very important faces behind the Global Forum, who will tell you more about the Central Forum's past and present. They are Joe Matthews. He's one of the two co-presidents of the Global Forum. He is Californian and a local democracy columnist at the nonprofit LA-based media platform Socolo Public Square. Since the beginning, Joe is the master of moderating the life writing of the forum's declaration. And then they are Andreas Müller. He is the general manager of Democracy International based in Köln in Germany. The NGO was established, was established in 2011 and developed by Andreas to a leading democracy support organization. It provides the basic infrastructure of, for each global forum together with the changing local partners and cities. Then they are Caroline Vernayen, responsible at Democracy International for public relations and global community building. That fits together perfectly with her role as one of the main organizers of the global forum. And then they are Bruno Kaufmann, the second co-president of the Global Forum. He lives in Sweden and is journalist at the Swiss Broadcast Company. Bruno is also the coordinator of Democracy Beat at Swiss Info, which is our international media partner for the Global Forum. And very important, Bruno was one of the co-founders of the Global Forum in 2008. Still individually, you four have organized 30 times a global forum in the last 50 years. The stage is yours. Woo! 
Can everyone hear me? Um, you know, we've, we've never had a protocol officer uh, in the 15 years of the global department. We have some dignitaries here. Thank you, Madam Speaker, Mr. Mayor, and others, many dignitaries um, for coming this way. Um, also, big thanks to all of the sponsors here on the page to make this possible. It's the most extraordinary collection uh, put together. And a big thanks to Adriana. This forum has been, because of pandemic delays, uh, uh, organized and reorganized multiple times. Now, um, that's that's giving credit. I'm giving credit, but that's not you know what I do for a living. I'm a journalist, and what we journalists do is we assign blame. And so, who is to blame for all of us being here on on on, on this uh, on this Wednesday night so, uh, in, in lovely Lucerne, where there are you know beautiful things and beautiful places to see just outside? Um, who is really to blame? And it really comes down to one person, a politician, though he's known for other things as well. Um, his name is Arnold Schwarzenegger. <laughs> and in, in 2006, in the winter of 2006, um, I was uh, an LA Times reporter in Sacramento in the governor's office, which is called the Horseshoe, because it's shaped like a horseshoe. Um, and I was trying to finish up a book about Governor Schwarzenegger. And in walked this gentleman, um, Bruno Kaufman. Um, we were introduced by a, a longtime friend of mine, a man named Joe Fox, who uh, couldn't be with us tonight. His health is not good, but I think of him all, often. He's a friend of mine for 15 years, and we agree on absolutely nothing. And there should be more friendships based on disagreement. Friendly, friendly disagreement. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And um, we began to talk, and we were introduced, and then talked afterwards about direct democracy. I am from, he's from Switzerland, a model direct democracy, you know, and Cal, I'm from, and he's from Switzerland, and I'm from California, the sort of example of what not to do when it comes to direct democracy for most people. But we both realized that he knew more than me, but that we just didn't know a lot of, enough about direct democracy. We didn't know, we knew it was growing, but where were all the places were growing? Is it was happening mostly at the local level or the subnational level? It's very hard to get data on that. We didn't have rules, we didn't have practice, and we didn't know all the people that were involved in it. So this, so we just, so Bruno really decided, and I followed his lead, that we should try to bring those people together and have rules and practice, so we could know what the heck was really going on out there in this world, and really have a, a forum that looks at democracy um, from. The the bottom up uh, rather than the top down, which is still the way we talk and consider about it. Um, so that is uh, what began this conversation in, in 2006, led to Bruno convening a meeting in 2008, and here is where I can make over the okay. <laughs> So yes, so that's my job then. Um, I think we can switch to the, the next slide. So because my job is to then what happened after that meeting in Schwarzenegger's office and uh, um, and what happened after the first forum, which is placed on a R, but perfectly well, of what is the standard understanding of this, pro this conference for the global forum COVID process? And yeah, what we what we have is that the one thing what, what the global forum is, it's, it's a traveling conference, right? So since 2008, we are traveling to different vibrant democratic places worldwide. We started 2008 in Aarau, then we went to 2009 to Seoul already, 2010 to San Francisco. 2012 to Montevideo, uh, 2014 to Tunisia, we heard already after the Arab Spring, 2016 to um, Rome, uh, to Santa Batia, and then 2018 to Rome, 2019 to Taichung, and now we're here in Luzerne. And yeah, that is what we do. And of course, we hope that there are a lot of other pages coming up in the next years. So the, the second main point about what the global forum process is is that it's an open and inclusive process and we try to include as many people, interested citizens, politicians, NGOs, administration, um, researchers, and of course, uh, democratic, democratic democracy activists from all over the world. And of course, the Global Forum is always free of charge. And that's going to be the third point of the self-understanding of the Global Forum, which is it's a cooperative project. The global, the global forum could not be organized by only one person or by uh, alone, but there are a lot of partners, foundations, giving us, of course, financial support, but especially also automatically support for the work we do since 2008. 
Um, and yeah, I'm happy that I see a lot of familiar faces today. And I want to say welcome here in Luzern. Thank you. And I think that probably show a little more what we do in Luzern in the next days. Yeah, so um, I think you've, you've heard it now a couple of times. This is the 10th Global Forum on Modern Area Democracy that we organize. So it's a, an anniversary edition. And, and actually, one of the things that we are most proud of organizing this, organizing this Global Forum is you guys, um, because you have made your way here from all over the world. And we can maybe show the next slide. Um, you are over 500 people, not all of them in this room today, but over the next couple of days, over 500 people will join us from every continent on this planet, from over 60 countries. Um, these are people, you are people who've made their, who've made your way here, uh, you've contributed to the program, you've sent us your ideas, many of you are speakers, we, over, we have over 130 people actually involved in one of the sessions, and we hope that, of course, everybody who is not an official speaker will talk in sessions as well because this global forum is all about conversation it's all about talking to each other it's all about exchange um, and getting to know each other so um really thank you thank you very much for joining us and for making this global forum such a wonderful participatory process um as we've heard um we will talk about many different topics in the next couple of days we have thematic tracks many of you are bringing very uh, specific perspectives into this global forum, um, and we will hear a little bit more about that from you. Yes, thank you very much, and very welcome to CERN and the Global Forum here. And the Global Forum is also about practice. Uh, I have uh, the privilege of uh, being a citizen of different countries, related European Union and cities. To vote more than 1,000 people already. So, uh, what we want to do, this is a week of decision making in Switzerland. We have more than 500 different issues at the ballot in different municipalities, cantons, and on the national level. We will see a lot of that until Sunday. But we want also that everybody of you are able to vote this week. So, we have chosen three questions. You are able to vote, and we have this official box. From Luzern, but of course, I have to say this is not an official vote. <laughs> but you will be able to vote on a local issue from Luzern, namely the issue about the climate protection strategy. And we will, we will also be experiencing that as the citizens of Luzern this weekend, we'll have to vote on a proposal, on a counter proposal, and on a decisive question. That's a way of making fine tuned decisions. You will also have uh, are invited to vote on a cantonal issue from the canton of Bern about lowering the voting age from 18 to 16, a big issue, a growing issue, also in Switzerland. And finally, you're invited to vote on the initiative for banning, um, uh, uh, banning factory farming. It's one of the initiatives people in this country vote this weekend. So please use your right to vote in the global forum as well tomorrow at the info station at the Neumann. This ballot box will be there. Uh, you will be able to vote those on Saturday and on Sunday. We will declare results after 12 o'clock when all the results are declared. So it will be very interesting to see how we will forum are deciding on issues which also are on the decision here in Sweden. Welcome to thank you very much. Thank you very much for all these insights on the global forum. It gave a sense of the richness of the Global Forum, and it also gave a sense of the work which was put into it. Thank you very much also to you for well, Global always starts on a local level, initiated by individuals. As we just heard, the 10th Global Forum is happening on many interesting locations also here, and especially thanks to many, uh, to a lot of partners. Many of the valuable partners are sitting in this room. I would like to take this opportunity to invite four representatives of these partners to take the stage on behalf of all of them. These are Alexander Trechtel, professor at the University of Lucerne, Beat Zwicky, mayor of the city of Lucerne, yeah, please come here, and Michael von der Lohe, director of the Omnibus of Direct Democracy. 
Patricia and Patricia and our Skyther from Swiss Info, our media partner. Please join me here and share your welcome words and your motivation for being a partner of the Global Forum. Mr. Travis and Alex, let's start very, very local. Democracy always in the center of your research. You made your journey from the University of Geneva to the European, European University Institute in Florence, to the Bergman Center at Harvard University, and to the University of Lucerne, which is hosting the Global Forum today. What was the motivation of the university to become a partner? Uh, well, thank you very much. Uh, actually, in the name of the entire lecture of the university, uh, let me first uh, foremost warmly welcome you all uh, to uh, the premises of the University of Lucerne. We're the smallest university in Switzerland, but we're steadily uh, growing and we are focusing on human sciences. Um, and uh, many of our students and our researchers are actually working on democracy issues surrounding democracy in Europe and Switzerland and beyond. And so it's a, it's a real great pleasure for us to be partnering with the uh, Global Forum 22 edition of the Global Forum on Modern Direct Democracy. And uh, I wish you all a really fascinating journey across the next four, four or so days in, in Lucerne. My, my personal motivation, if you allow me, uh, for having dedicated my, my entire professional uh, career as an academic uh, to the topic of, of democracy in general and to direct democracy more in particular has to do with my fascination. My colleagues in the backdrop share that fascination and all our professors and students do share that, uh, that fascination um, for the ability of democracies and institutions with actors and structures to actually um, overcome conflict in a, in a peaceful way. Uh, my, my doctoral thesis from 100 years ago was dealing with direct democracy uh, in Switzerland at the cantonal level. And most of you are, of course, familiar with the referendum initiative process um, at the national level, at the federal level in Switzerland and elsewhere. But maybe not so many of you or fewer know about this enormously rich experience with direct democracy at the regional and the local. Uh, levels, and uh, this is precisely one of the important topics uh, that will be covered by the forum. Also, I had a chance to uh, co-lead uh, a group of scholars that were producing a green paper for the Council of Europe some 20 years ago, um, and it is both exciting and frightening at the same time to see how many of our predictions, actually our hopes and our worries since then have uh, come true. On the one hand, democracy has never been living more intensively um, across uh, the globe. Uh, there are new forms of citizen participation, conjunction with technological innovations, the internet, of course, that have mushroomed it everywhere with great success. Um, participatory budgeting, citizen assemblies, transnational mobilization, global grassroots um, movements, just to name um, a few. On the other hand, democracy is, uh, and I must say again, in great danger. We've heard it already at the beginning. And not only uh, horrifying wars initiated by autocratic regimes and uh, dictators, uh, but also the same technological change that can be used uh, to the benefit of citizens are now threatening democracy around the globe. Studies, including those that were conducted here at the University of Lucerne, uh, have shown the potentially devastating effect of algorithms, for example, on democracy. But there are also fake news that are intelligently uh, spreading, undermining elections. There are hackers that attack the very functioning of the processes in the world, add to that global pandemic that um, has been a challenge for democratic decision making around the world. And finally, this week, pseudo direct democracy is practiced throughout uh, through the use of fake referendums in Ukraine. So, the main motivation is really to, to be a partner of this forum that uh, is a place that brings together practitioners. Um, activists, media specialists, politicians, 
citizens uh, and academics to discuss the current state of democracy. Um, and so we all hope it's, it's right for the future. And uh, to be part of this uh, process is not just for myself, but for the entire university of Lucerne, uh, a great privilege. And I would like to really warmly thank the organizers for their uh, invaluable energy and, and dedication uh, to make this forum. Thank you very much. Now, from the University of Lucerne to the city of Lucerne and from English to German. Liebe Herzlichen, Sie sind Präsident dieses schönen Luzerns, das sich soeben dem Netzwerk Liga der Demokratiestädte angeschlossen hat. Luzern wird mit dem Global Forum zum Dialog statt, welches sind Ihre Worte zum Global Forum? Meine sehr geehrten Damen und Herren, geschätzte Gäste aus allen fünf Kontinenten, Ladies and Gentlemen, dear citizens. Es ist mir eine große Freude, Sie in Luzern, mitten in der Schweiz, herzlich begrüßen zu dürfen. Die kleine Stadt Luzern bietet während fünf Tagen, so klein ist sie nicht, aber im Vergleich natürlich schon mit den weltweit anderen großen Städten. Sie bietet während fünf Tagen hunderten Teilnehmerinnen und Teilnehmern des Demokratieforums eine vorübergehende Einheit. As the mayor of Lucerne, I, I, I give me great pleasure to welcome all of our guests tonight to our seat in the heart of Switzerland. The world famous 700 years old Chapel Bridge has become the unmistakable symbol of the city of Lucerne. And there are many other bridges in the city for the use of pedestrians, cars, and trains. In the 14th century, Lausanne was already known throughout Europe as the city of bridges, because at that time, no other town had four bridges joining various districts. Brücken verbinden nicht bloß seit Ufer. Vielmehr führen sie Menschen zueinander. Diese Menschen und Völker verbindende Funktion hat die Stadt Luzern seit ihrem Bestehen erfüllen. Das Demokratieforum gibt uns nun die Gelegenheit, diese Tradition weiterzusetzen. Wir wollen Ihnen mit den typischen Luzerner Eigenarten die Atmosphäre schaffen, damit Sie Ihre Zusammenkunft hier genießen können. Sie sollen von vielen persönlichen Kontakten kulturellem Austausch und einigen Einblicken in lokale, demokratische Abläufe profitieren können. Die Bevölkerung ist, wie die für die Schweiz typisch, meistens nicht überschwänglich, manchmal bleibt etwas zurückhaltend. Die Luzernerinnen und Luzern sind jedoch festfreudig und umgänglich, interessiert und in manchen Belangen durchaus innovativ. Beispielsweise wurde vor bald 30 Jahren, genau am 20. November 1991, in Luzern das Kinderparlament gegründet. Seither tagen die Kinder in Vollversammlungen und in Untergruppen. Das Kinderparlament hat nach wenigen Jahren das Recht erhalten, im Stadtparlament Vorstöße einzureichen. Die Kinder verfügen zudem über ein eigenes Leben. Zugegeben etwas kleines Budget. Sie sprechen selbstständig Unterstützungsbeiträge an Projekte, die ihnen sinnvoll erscheinen. Das Kinderparlament steht Kinder im Alter von 8 bis 14 Jahren offen. Aktuell hat es 78 Mitglieder. Einen Schweizer Pass brauchen sie nicht. Sie müssen lediglich in der Stadt Luzern wohnen. Diese Einschränkung gilt auch für die Mitglieder des Jugendparlaments. Es steht Menschen im Alter von 14 bis 23 Jahren offen. Es freut mich, dass Sie am Sonntag zum Abschluss des Global Forums die städtische Abstimmung über unsere Klima- und Energiestrategie verfolgen können. Wir haben es vorhin hier gesehen. Es steht dem Vorschlag des Stadtparlaments ein konkreter Gegenvorschlag des Referendumskomitees entgegen. 
Der Abstimmungsmodus ist anspruchsvoll. Man könnte auch sagen, vielleicht ein bisschen kompliziert. Zuerst gilt es, jede Vorlage einzeln zuzustimmen oder sie abzulehnen. Und dann ist die Stichfrage zu beantworten, welche der beiden bevorzugt wird, sollten beide eine zustimmende Mehrheit gefunden haben. Ich bin gespannt, ich bin sehr gespannt und auch Sie dürfen gespannt sein, dass wir das auch sein wird. Sie werden in den kommenden Tagen auf verschiedenen Ebenen und zu unterschiedlichen Themen Fachreferate hören. Es ist ein riesiges Programm, das Sie gesehen haben und sich auch diskursiv austauschen können. Dabei lehnen Sie auch das Schaffung selber, das hoffentlich etwas besser kennen. Sie werden in Ausflüge in andere Schweizer Städte können, immer mit dem Apozern zurückkommen natürlich. Und ich hoffe sehr, dass Ihnen Zeit für den persönlichen Austausch bleibt. So könnte Luzern Brücken bauen zwischen Menschen, Sprachen, politischen Grundhaltungen. Ich hoffe sehr, dass es gelingt, den Brückenschlag herzustellen. Ich hoffe, Ihnen der Aufenthalt in Luzern als unvergessliches Erlebnis in Westen der Länder und Weiten. Herzlichen Dank, dass Sie alle nach Luzern gekommen sind. Mit wenn sich der Luzern bietet die besten Konditionen dafür, dass das Global Forum ein unvergessliches wird. Und ich merke, ich muss ein strenger Zeit Timekeeper werden. Also je näher ich dahin stelle, desto, desto äh, näher sind wir am Ende der Zeit. Genau. From the city of Luzern, now across the borders. Michael, you are the director of the Omnibus for Direct Democracy. The Omnibus drove all the way down from North Germany to be here with us. Please, what did you bring? Do we all enter the world as a blank sheet of paper? Everyone is an artist. This is the most famous sentence of Joseph Beuys, an artist who died in 1986 and opened the way for us, for the omnibus, and for our people in Germany to work for direct democracy. He had an action on Documenta 1972, which was called Organisation für Direkte Demokratie durch Volksabstimmung. Organisation for Direct Democracy through Referendum. A community building or a huge piece of art he called the social sculpture. The omnibus. The omnibus is a company which has an omnibus, and we are 35 years old. This omnibus is on the street since the year 2000, now 22 years on the road. Werner Kuppers from the year in the town as well. Our company is named Omnibus. We've got an omnibus as a main action element. An omnibus is a Latin word, which means translated for all, through all, with all. We initiate and support referendum on country level, on municipal level. We work for an unconditional ground income. We got weekly circle talks. We got a research group for a new kind of democratic money circulation. I want to show you this picture. This was <laughs> the starting action of the white omnibus. He as a white flag in the sky of Berlin. 
And the white flag was in the beginning not a flag to say we surrender. It was a flag to say we need to talk. Our background is the art. The challenge in art is that the artist always takes over the responsibility for his work. He's able to keep out his ego and his habits and tradition. Only then something new can appear. Don't we need to go into response with the living? The ecological and take over responsibility. Isn't it yet hotter, hotter outside because our hearts are so cold? Can you imagine that democracy is part of the ecology? Can you imagine that democracies driven by selfish parties must end up in autocracy and then dictatorship if there is no well-designed direct democracy? Direct democracy is getting more and more increasingly important. And the gesture of making art extended on everything is the solution. Thank you very much, Michael. We are we waiting for you all near the chapel bridge. Definitely worth a visit. And now from the bump and from Germany to the world, we have here with us Patricia and Wurst. You both are journalists working for the Swiss public broadcasting company since a long, long time. And you both are representing Sweden for our media partner. Thank you. Hello, everybody. I'm very happy to see you because for me, you are the important person here. Yeah. Uh, you, you are the experts in the world and uh, you are leading democracy. So thank you. I'm Patricia Islas. I'm a Mexican. And next to me is Sir Geiser. He is also a journalist, a Swiss, and he works in like the expert of democracy and the English department. So we we work uh, about the right about democracy. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, hello, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, I'll use the opportunity to present briefly Swiss Info, um, an information and news platform in 10 languages. We are a unit of the public Swiss Broadcasting Corporation and produce content um, about Switzerland by an audience abroad. Over the past nine years, we've built up considerable expertise on democracy. And of course, we also cover Sunday's votes. Um, and these votes, as you know, are a key element of Switzerland's um, system of direct democracy. Yes, I'm uh, in charge of uh, coordinating this work with those and other colleagues. Uh, for reporting uh, the next Sunday, twelve Sunday, and we work, in, for instance, in Arabic, Spanish, or Chinese, Portuguese, and uh, yeah, the language. And uh, for us, for us, the challenge is always to explain uh, to a person in maybe Morocco what happened in Switzerland, and it's really, really. Uh, a situation that is not easy because we need expertise for our young people. Uh, a possible answer um, to explain to our audience what they have or what's going on in Switzerland is to adapt the reports according to the specific needs of this community, language community. That means we have to make an extra effort to explain our background 
And I find that is normally not included in domestic arrangements, this way for example. Our colleague Ter from Syria or Tomoko from Japan mentioned just two of the CSA protein will tailor their reports to their own specific needs. Give you an example. On Sunday, the Swiss wrote on four issues. And for a Swiss public, the pension reform might be a priority. But our colleagues, uh, Tom Hoffman, a colleague of Tom Hoffman from Japan, he plans to focus on the other main way. Uh, and on factory farming. Um, and she, if she's interested in that topic, she thinks her audience is more interested in any sort of her. And now we have a um, way that I want to invite you to use because it's a platform uh, for debates in 10 languages. So you are the experts and we invite you to to participate in these debates because we can, uh, it's an instrument that, that um, uh, keep down the barriers, the language barriers, and we can talk with our uh, audience and uh, you are our audience. I hope that you might like be to participate and also follow our, our coverage next uh, Sunday. Uh, Thank you, Patricia. Thank you. All of the forest partners will be representing many others. The Global Forum wouldn't be what it is without you. And now, after looking back and after meeting faces behind the Global Forum and after meeting partners of the Global Forum, let's start now. Let's open the 10th Global Forum officially. As you heard, after 40 years, we are back in Switzerland with the Global Forum, and it is a huge pleasure to us to celebrate that with the, what we call the highest citizen of Switzerland. We are very happy to welcome Madam President of the National Council of Switzerland, Irene Kelling, among us. Dear Madam President, dear Irene, you held various offices at different federal levels. You were a member of the Grand Council of the Kapler Aargau before you became a member of the National Council in 2017. You also were vice chairwoman of the Green Party of Switzerland. And your life is kind of very strongly interwoven with the democratic system in Switzerland. You and me actually were born in a year almost at the end of the 80s, which um, made us grow up in a generation where democracy was kind of taken for granted. Today, you are president of the National Council of Switzerland in a time where democracy is facing major challenges. Madam President, Irene, the stage is yours to open the 2022 Global Forum on Modern Direct Democracy. Maybe a technical language remark first. As of course, as the first citizen of Switzerland, I would express myself in a Swiss national language that would be German for all those not the understanding German. Meine sehr verehrten Damen und Herren, liebe Freundinnen und Freunde der Demokratie aus der Schweiz und aus der ganzen Welt, ich bin in eine Demokratie hineingeboren worden. Ich bin in einem demokratischen Land aufgewachsen und ich mache Politik in einem Land, von dem ich glaube, dass es seit 51 Jahren, seit der Einführung des Frauenstimmrechts, eine wirklich gute Demokratie ist. Ein Land, das ein demokratisches System gerne mit einem Superlativ attributiert und sich die beste oder zumindest eine der besten Demokratien der Welt nennt. Und es ist wahr, in keinem anderen Land der Welt sind die unmittelbaren Volksrechte und die Volkssouveränität sowie die direkt demokratische Bürgerinnenpartizipation so stark ausgebaut wie in der Schweiz. 
Im internationalen Vergleich werden die Schweizerinnen und Schweizer mit Abstand am häufigsten an die Urne berufen, um über wichtige politische Fragen die abschließende Entscheidung zu wählen. Und dies nicht nur auf nationaler, sondern auch auf kantonaler, also auf regionaler und auf lokaler Ebene. Und mit oder ohne Superlativ, ja, wir dürfen mich stolz sagen, dass unsere, unsere Schweiz, unser demokratisches System in der Schweiz ein gutes ist. Aber auch gute Demokratien haben ihre Fehler und ihre Lücken. Und ich, ich glaubte lange, es ging nur darum, unser demokratisches System zu verbessern. Der Frage nachzugehen, wie wir jene Menschen bei uns leben und arbeiten, seit Jahren bei uns leben und arbeiten, aber keinen Schweizer Pass haben, besser einbinden können. Wie wir die Jüngsten unserer Gesellschaft, die nicht mitbestimmen können, aber am längsten von den Entscheidungen, die wir für sie treffen, betroffen sind, wie wir sie mit einbeziehen können in unsere Entscheide. Und wie wir Menschen mit besonderen Bedürfnissen und Einschränkungen besser teilhaben lassen können an unserer Demokratie. Aber die Demokratie an sich habe ich für selbstverständlich genommen. Ich glaube fest daran, dass die Demokratie selbstverständlich ist. Dass die Demokratie nur gewinnen kann, weil sie selbst überzeugend den Beweis längst erbracht hat, dass sie für uns Menschen und eine freie Gesellschaft das einzige politische System ist, das allen dient. Aber ich und mit mir viele habe mich geirrt. Es brauchte einen menschenverachtenden und mit nicht gerechtfertigten Angriffskrieg, um mir mit aller Macht der Gewalt und auch einen Moment des Schreckens vor Augen zu führen, wie unglaublich verschieden und zerbrechlich Demokratie und all die mit ihr gebundenen Werte und Freiheiten sind. Weil sich ein souveränes Land die Freiheit genommen hat, sich für einen eigenständigen Weg zu entscheiden, einen Weg der Demokratie, der europäischen Gemeinschaft und der europäischen Wertegemeinschaft, müssen sie genau nun diese Werte mit waffengewaltigen den russischen Aggressor verteidigen. Und damit rückt dieser Krieg nicht nur die Zerbrechlichkeit und Wichtigkeit von Demokratie in ein völlig neues Licht, sondern damit betrifft dieser Krieg auch uns alle. Nicht weil es ein Angriffskrieg ist auf dem europäischen Kontinent, nicht weil er so nahe ist, sondern weil sich dieser Krieg gegen uns alle richtet, gegen unsere gemeinsamen Werte. Er ist ein Angriff auf Frieden, Sicherheit, Demokratie und die Menschenrechte. Er tritt internationales Völkerrecht nur mit Füßen, sondern er räumt die Waffengewalt aus dem Weg. Er ist die Ursache für die 65.000 Ukrainerinnen und Ukrainer, die zu uns geflüchtet sind. Er ist die Ursache für die 12 Millionen Ukrainerinnen, die weltweit auf der Flucht sind. Und ja, er ist auch die Ursache dafür, dass Benzin und Diesel momentan teuer sind, dass wir auf eine Energiemangellage zusteuern, dass wir alle Energie sparen müssen dass die Strompreise gestiegen sind und wohl noch weiter steigen werden, aber vor allem, dass Menschen hungern, dass Menschen sterben, Soldaten, aber auch viele Frauen, Männer und Kinder. Es geht also nicht nur, wie ich immer dachte, um die Frage, wie man Demokratie verbessern kann oder wie man die Demokratisierung vorantreiben kann. Nein, es geht um die Frage der Demokratie an sich, auch bei uns, für uns alle. Denn Demokratie ist nicht selbstverständlich. Sie lebt nur, wenn wir sie leben, wenn wir für sie einstehen und wenn wir für sie aufstehen. Stehen wir also auch für die Demokratie, weil sie nicht selbstverständlich ist, gerade jetzt in diesen Streiten. Stehen wir auch und ein für die Menschen in der Ukraine, weil sie unsere Werte verteidigen, gerade jetzt, so wie an jedem einzelnen Tag der letzten sieben Monate dieses schrecklichen Krieges. Ich danke Ihnen für Ihre Aufmerksamkeit und wünsche Ihnen und uns allen die Kraft und den Mut jeden Tag aufs Neue aufzustehen und uns einzusetzen. Füreinander, miteinander, für die Demokratie. Und ich wünsche Ihnen allen gute Diskussionen und spannende Gespräche am heutigen Abend und in den kommenden Tagen. Thank you very much, Madam President, dear Irene, for your call to stand up for democracy. We will keep doing it, of course. As the session at the National Council still is running, and you have a tight schedule, I'm sorry about this micro, um, we give you some concern treats on your way. Um, should I? Yeah. And we wish you an unwavering 
energy for your engagement in the name of democracy. Thank you. A very important feature of the Global Forum is to provide a platform for different perspectives on the issue of participation. Our, follow so, um, our four following guests will shed a light on the topic from different perspectives, their very own perspective. The most important thing besides living the present is to talk about the future. And as young people are much more affected by decisions of today, and it is absolutely essential to hear also young voices. That's why our first guest for the perspective is Salvina Knobel. Salvina is 16 years old. She's a high school student and an active member of the youth parliament. We already heard something about youth parliament today. Salina, as a representative, will share with you her view on the power of the youth in democracy. And she is certainly a very dedicated young person speaking for other people in Switzerland and in the world. Salina, thank you for joining us this day. Thank you. Democracy. When I was asked to talk about what democracy means to me, the sentence <laughs> from Aristotle came to my mind. He said, they should rule who are able to rule best. To me, they means clearly all the people, because all of us share the future. We are all responsible for the decisions and actions that we take as an individual and as a nation. In Switzerland, only 40% fulfill that responsibility. In the last poll, 60% of the people eligible to vote in Switzerland did not participate. 60%. Apparently, the future of Switzerland lies within the other 40% of people, adding up to 2.2 million. 2.2 million is a small fraction of the over 8.5 million people living in Switzerland. I'm Sylvina Klo, and I have never been part of the 2.2 million people deciding the future of Switzerland. I'm 16 years old in high school here in the Sur. In my free time, I love to climb, make music, and of course, try to make the world a little bit better. I do this as the president of the student organization at my school, as a member of the local youth parliament and with my interest in politics in general. I'm standing here representing the new generation. Personally, I've never known anything else than democracy. I've had the privilege of living in a stable country where elections and voting can be trusted, and I'm incredibly thankful for that. Democracy has made me an independent thinking person. So here I am. Switzerland is often seen as the epitome of democracy. People here have a lot of possibilities.
um, have some energizers for you. And you are an excellent example of why you should listen to young people. The second and next perspective also is future oriented. It's about the role of technology <coughs> and digitalization in democratic processes. We are happy to have a very special guest talking about this topic. As the guest will speak German, I will also switch the language. Es geht uns über alles heute Abend zur Eröffnung des 10. Global Forums, Altbundesrat Moritz Leuerberger begrüßen zu dürfen. Er war von 1995 bis 2010 Mitglied der Schweizer Regierung und somit des Bundesrats. Und er amtierte 2001 und 2006 als Bundespräsident der Schweiz. Während dieser Zeit war Altbundesrat Leuerberger Vorsteher des Kubik, dem Departement, für Umwelt, Verkehr, Energie und Kommunikation. Lieber Herr Altbundesrat, lieber Herr Leuenberger, Sie erlebten während dieser Zeit sehr große Umwälzungen. Die Kommunikation hat sich auf neue Kanäle verlagert und wurde schneller und schneller. Und rasch waren davon auch die demokratischen Prozesse betroffen. Und neben anderen Ämtern, die Sie heute auch immer noch bekleiden, sind Sie der Präsident des Leitungsausschusses der TEA Swiss und setzen sich sehr direkt mit Chancen und Risiken neuer Technologien auseinander. Heute sind Sie hier bei uns mit dem Info dazu, dass Demokratie definitiv nicht nur eine Form ist. Ich die Demokratien stehen weltweit nicht im Vormarsch. Sie stehen unter Beschuss von außen, auch im wörtlichen Sinn. Sie sind aber auch von innen gefährdet. Es gibt Demokratien in Europa und in den beiden Amerikas, die befinden sich in einem zerrissenen Zustand, um nicht zu sagen, im kalten Bürgerkrieg. Der Fall der Berliner Mauer und des Eisernen Vorhangs hat der Demokratie weltweit keinen Auftrieb verliehen. Das hofften wir zwar alle, das hofften viele, aber das Gegenteil war der Fall. In der Wirtschaft zeigten sich viele begeistert davon, wie Autokraten ihre Staaten doch effizient und unternehmerisch führten. Und je mehr sich die westliche Wirtschaft mit autoritären Großmächten verflocht, desto weniger galten ihr demokratische Werte. Und an den linken und rechten Rändern der politischen Bewegungen wird ganz offen für Autokraten geschwärmt. Demokratien verändern sich zum Glück, denn sonst hätten wir in der Schweiz ja noch gar kein Frauenstimmrecht und kein Proporzwahlrecht und keine Referendums- und Initiativrechte. Unsere Demokratien werden sich weiter verändern, sonst wären es keine Demokratien. Eine treibende Kraft ist die Digitalisierung. Ihre Kinder heißen Internet, Smartphone und soziale Medien. Und diese digitale Familie prägt und verändert unser Denken, unser Fühlen, unser Verhalten und damit auch die Demokratie. Digitale Innovationen erleichtern unsere demokratische Verantwortung. Es gibt unzählige Start-ups mit digitalen Dienstleistungen, Apps, die lokale politische Themen aufgreifen, Apps für politische Partizipation von Jugendlichen, Apps für Online-Unterschriftensammlungen, Plattformen mit politischen Informationen und Ideenaustausch. Solche Projekte nehmen die ursprüngliche Bedeutung der Citoyennes und Citoyens auf und verleihen ihnen in Zeiten der globalen Digitalisierung einen neuen Thema. Die Geschwindigkeit digitaler und demokratischer Prozesse klaffen aber weit auseinander. Und immer wieder wird gefordert, auch bei uns müssen sich politische Abläufe wesentlich beschleunigen, um in der globalen Welt Schritt zu halten. Das ist kurzsichtig. Die Meinungsbildung in unseren Demokratien soll Minderheiten aufnehmen, widersprüchliche Auffassungen austarieren, Kompromisse ermöglichen und die notwendige Zeit auch für ein Umdenken aller Betroffenen garantieren. Und das braucht Zeit. Aber es ist nachhaltig. 
Die gewonnene Einigkeit verhilft einem Projekt zu einer schnelleren Durchführung, als ein dauernd nachher mit Widerständen gerechnet werden muss. Das Allgemeinwohl zu bestimmen, ist in einer Demokratie die Sache aller, das erfordert Zeit und Sorgfalt, und das ist im digitalen Zeitalter durchaus möglich. Wir können die Politik nicht Expertinnen und Experten oder gar Algorithmen überlassen. Kein Zweifel, die Digitalisierung hat die Demokratie erneuert und verbessert. Sie hat Behörden und Bürger näher zueinander gebracht. Dank ihr werden Informationen und Dienstleistungen der Verwaltung schneller erbracht. Aber der Offline-Bürger fällt durch die Maschen, wenn er digitale Technologien und Medien nicht nutzen kann. Es widerspricht der Rechtsgleichheit, wenn Menschen, welche im Umgang mit digitaler Technik ungenügend ausgebildet sind, vom Zugang zu Informationen ausgeschlossen werden. Und noch wichtiger, wenn sie von lebensrettenden Maßnahmen ausgeschlossen sind, wie das bei der Covid bei uns zum Teil der Fall war, eine Impfung war nicht mehr möglich, wenn jemand sich digital äh, nicht auskommt. Eine Demokratie muss allen das Recht auf Zugang zu staatlichen Dienstleistungen garantieren, auch Analphabeten und jenen, die sich offline bewegen, ob sie das müssen oder wollen. Staaten, die eine rasche Umsetzung von E-Government vollbrachten, erlebten markante Rückschläge im Kontakt mit ihren Bürgerinnen und Bürgern. Denn parallel zur digitalen Kommunikation mit ihren Online-Formularen und ungeleglichen Bots wurden telefonische und direkte Kontakte an Schaltern und in Büros abgeschafft. Die Bürgernähe wurde der Effizienz geopfert. Zu einem Staat mit menschlichem Antlitz gehört aber das Recht auf persönliche Gespräche an einem Schalter oder am Telefon, um etwas erklärt zu bekommen, um auf alternative Möglichkeiten hingewiesen zu werden. Alles andere ist unmenschlich und damit undemokratisch. Frustration und Widerstand sind dann die Folge und die Wut richtet sich dann gegen den Staat. Digitaltechnik nutzt binäre Werte. Sie kann nur die beiden Zustände 0 oder 1 annehmen. Diese reduzierte und beschränkte Vorgehensweise überträgt sich auch unser aller Denken. Keine Differenzierungen, keine Grautöne, nur entweder für oder gegen ein Projekt, für oder gegen eine Meinung, nur der liebe Gott und der böse Teufel, dazwischen nichts. So verkümmert die demokratische Auseinandersetzung zur Bipolarität. Eine zunehmende Polarisierung in allen Demokraten ist eine Folge davon. Dieses binäre Verhaltensmuster des Entweder oder entspricht aber eben gerade nicht dem Wesen der Demokratie. Ob Konsumentin, Staatsbürger, Kundin, Klient oder Patientin, wir werden alle zu einem Multiple-Choice-Verhalten konditioniert. Früher in analogen Beziehungen, da konnten wir uns gegenüber anderen Menschen erklären und differenzieren. Heute mutieren wir zu binären Wesen, die nur noch Ä oder Ä blöden führen. Und diese Verblödungstendenz greift die Substanz heutiger Demokratien an. Digitale Technologien errechnen ökonomische Werte. Werte, auf denen Religionen, Philosophien, oder die Zivilisation gebaut sind, können sie nicht erfassen. Die Demokratie ist ein wesentliches Fundament der Zivilisation. Sie beschränkt sich nicht auf das Ritual von Wahlen und Abstimmungen, auf das Auszählen von Mehrheiten. Die Demokratie ist viel mehr als eine Staatsform. Sie ist eine Form des solidarischen Zusammenlebens von Menschen verschiedener Herkunft, Unabdingbar mit der Demokratie verbunden sich deshalb das Suchen nach Kompromissen, der Einbezug von Minderheiten, der Rechtsstaat, die Gewaltenteilung, die Macht begrenzt. Das kann alles sehr verschieden organisiert werden und demokratische Institutionen ändern sich ja auch ständig, doch die Grundsätze bleiben unverändert und sie müssen verteidigt und stets neu erkämpft werden. 
Und dem dient das heutige Forum und ich bin froh, dass Sie daran teilnehmen. Vielen Dank. Ganz herzlichen Dank, Herr Leuenberger. Die unterschiedlichen Geschwindigkeiten der demokratischen und der digitalen Prozesse ist sicher ein Aspekt, der uns in den nächsten Tagen noch beschäftigen wird. Damit Sie nie an Geschwindigkeit verlieren, haben wir auch ein paar kulturelle Spezialitäten für Sie zusammengestellt. And now, from local to global, we continue with two perspectives with two international guests. The world is facing challenges which only can be solved on a global level. The following third perspective is focused on the climate crisis and how it can be addressed with democratic processes. Our next guest, Leonore Gewechsler, unfortunately couldn't, couldn't join us today, but she sent us a video. Leonore Gewechsler is a federal is the federal minister of for climate action and environment energy mobility innovation and technology in the austrian government since january 2020. Leonore Gewessler was born and grew up in southern southeastern austria for many years she directed the green european foundation in brussels was engaged in the making of the European Citizen Initiative and led the Global 2000 Environmental Protection Organization. As a minister, she was instrumental in establishing the so-called Klima Ticket in, for public transportation in Austria and the return of night trains, night trains to Europe. So let's give the digital stage to Claire Norek. In beautiful Luzern, but sitting for dear participants of the Global Forum on Modern Direct Democracy. I hope you've had a wonderful start to this year's Global Forum. I would have loved to join you in beautiful Luzern, but since my schedule won't allow it, this wishes by video from Vienna. This forum, of course, concerns global democracy in general. As a minister for climate action, I would like to address the role of democracy in connection with the climate crisis and our responses to it as a society. Today, the climate crisis has already progressed very, very far. I don't know how many of you follow the developments in international climate politics closely, but it is important to say that it is our common goal to keep the global temperature increase to 1.5 degrees above pre industrial levels. Currently, we have already reached an increase of around 1.2 degrees. Why is that important? Because climate scientists have made it strikingly clear that every fraction of a degree can make an enormous difference to the frequency of natural disasters and quite plainly, the future livability of this planet. Already today, we all see and feel the impacts of climate change from wildfires in the UK to devastating floods in Pakistan, and the worst drought in China on record. The Yangtze River has never been at a lower level. But unfortunately, we are not on track to prevent it from getting worse. We still emit staggering amounts of greenhouse gases. To change that, we will need to make fundamental adaptations to our economy and as a society. We will need to change the way we produce, we, the way we generate energy, heat, transport, you name it, that will not be easy. So the question will be whether we manage to make those changes quick enough, and if so, how we make them. And this is where democracy and conferences like this one come into play. Given the enormousness of the time, some have started to ask whether all these changes are even possible in a democratic society. 
invoking lengthy decision processes, changing policies and a changing government, and the difficulty to push through unpopular measures, or what seems to be unpopular measures. I have absolutely no doubt that democracy is essential to implement successful, sustainable, and just climate action. Why is that? Because democratic processes push governments and legislators to think thoroughly, to build consistent arguments, and to communicate openly and honestly. Democratic processes challenge a government to find the best solutions that have been discussed and reviewed by affected parties that have been challenged and questioned by the opposition and think tanks, NGOs and the media. These policies then become measures that need to be presented, explained and justified before the public. And that is a powerful model of quality management. And the most reliable course of action as far as public support for climate action is concerned. That is not to say that it will be easy to implement the necessary measures in a democratic society, but I believe it's the only way to do it properly and to build and maintain the people's support for it. But the advantages of democratic systems are not only limited to the output of the government, but also extend to the input that people can make into the system. In Austria, there was a citizen's initiative on a number of climate action measures, which received broad support by the public, as well as in Parliament. It resulted in a citizen's council on climate, representative of the Austrian society, chosen at random, which developed a number of recommendations for climate politics in Austria. We are now working on implementing them step by step and on ensuring that this group of engaged people get feedback. But of course, you are currently in a country that has even more experience and expertise when it comes to direct democracy, also for climate legislation. This Sunday, on 25th of September, as you might know, the Swiss will get to vote on a number of questions, and people in Luzern get to decide on the city's climate and energy strategy. This is a strong, powerful example that climate action and democracy work together. And I'm convinced that the future will show that people back the measures they vote for, which is so important because the next decades need to be characterized by consistent and ambitious and fair climate action measures that are accepted and supported by the people. That is the goal we're working towards, and democracy is the best tool to achieve it. I wish you all an interesting conference lots of engaging conversations and a good stay in the town. This then a digital thank you to Leonora de Westlip. She highlighted the point that democracy is essential to implement successful, just and sustainable action. But actually where do action begin? Well global challenges are being solved in front and behind our house door. Cities and communities are an, play an important role in these processes, as well as citizens are the motor for local and also for global democracy. And the fourth perspective is focused exactly on this topic. Our next guest welcomed here on the stage is Jose Manuel Ribeiro. Mr. Ribeiro is the mayor of the city of Valongo in Portugal. Valongo is neighboring Porto and it has almost 100,000 inhabitants. Mayor Ribeiro has combined his local government work with transnational networking for many years. After serving for eight years in the city parliament, he became mayor in 2013. Mayor Ribeiro, you have combined your professional political work with part-time occupations like goldsmithing, handicrafts, mining research, and international aid volunteering. That's an impressive spectrum, I would say. Today, you are a leading member of the Portuguese Association of Municipalities and very much involved in establishing international network of democracy cities. Mr. Ribeiro, welcome, welcome here in Lucerne and the stage is yours.
Well, first of all, I want to say thank you to the Swiss Democracy Foundation. It was very nice, the invitation. It's great to be here. I didn't, it's the first time in Lucerne. I'm completely inspired. I read a lot about the Swiss model. We don't have referendums as we would like. We have in the law, but as you know, it's very difficult in lots of countries. So it's great to be here. And uh, what I have to say, uh, my experience, I'm, a, I'm also a member of the Committee of the Regions. I'm a political member of uh, the United Cities and Global Government from the last years. I have to say, and I always say, go to the local government, candidate, go, don't stay at home. It's great. It's one of the most incredible experience. I was twice a member of the national parliament. I have, I was the national consumer ombudsman in Portugal, but nothing compares to the opportunity and our mayor knows that to work with the people. And I must say, I'm going to share my thoughts about local democracy. I call it the, the proximity democracy. It's different. We have to start saying these. We cannot talk about national democracies thinking that it's the same at the local level. No, no, it's different. At the proximity level, we can do a lot of things. And we are already doing it. For my, I'm connected with lots of networks and as a member of the Committee of the Regions, it's an important body created in the Treaty of Lisbon in the European Union. I know lots of communities everywhere in Europe. In South, in South America, in other continents. And we have nowadays great, great mayors, great teams that they don't have the same tools, but they create. For example, we do, we are forcing, we are putting pressure in our governments <clears throat> to put consultative processes in the process of doing law. It's a way. We know that parliamentary <clears throat> democracies, they don't like to give power because they work in a, in a top-down perspective. It's not easy. I had a chance of a tour during the afternoon. I, I, I learned about the fighting here in Lusa. It was a fight of several years, hundreds of years, to have nowadays your model. But it doesn't mean that we are not doing great things at the local level. And governments with the pandemic, they found out. One of the most important things of the local power, we, our proximity is really incredible. Without local governments during the pandemic, it was almost impossible to implement lots of politics. It was the mayors, the teams at the local level all over the world that has made the, the difference. I have to say also, because it's something that concerns, and I read, the local mayors in Ukraine fighting this aggression war are incredibly important. So the local mayors, even if we don't have the same tool we would like to have, but we have the popular initiative, but it's so difficult, so difficult, it depends on the court. We have in the law the chance to organize a referendum, but it's a court that decides if it's legal. It's incredible, it's, it's weird, it's crazy wrong. It's what it is. But I think we have to value and talk about the good things, the positive things. The local level, not only in Portugal, all over Europe, is a level of acceleration. It's a capillarity level. Grassroots, we learn. We have good mayors, good people at the local level nowadays. Of course, we know that uh, I don't believe when I heard, because I met some mayors of autocratic countries, they are doing great jobs, but they don't have freedom. They don't have freedom of speech. It's very difficult, but we have. And for me, I think that's one of the most important things. That's why it's so, dif so difficult. When I was elected, the, the second day, someone asked me, why do you run? Because listen, I think, and the question was, why do you run? And what is the most important thing of a mayor? And I think the most important thing of our job is to give hope people of, with what we do, with what we say, with the, the way we create opportunities, with the way we engage people. 
I mean, it's very difficult to organize referendums, but if we want and we do it, we can engage a lot of people. We have a council of child. We have several. The first town in Portugal to to be a member of the the network of uh, the city of child. We engage all the people in participatory mechanisms. We put young people discussing public space. It's possible if you want, but that's at the same time a very negative aspect because it depends on the will of the person at the moment. So it must be in the law. So challenges we have, we face every day. What I think is that, the, and I am, I'm very concerned just to, I'm very concerned with radicalization because we can deal with it at the local level. We discuss every day. I go to the streets every day. I, Walk around and do, doing it all day, the same thing. Go to the same cafe, speak with everybody, like the mayor, everybody knows that. And we have nowadays a problem. I, I think it's a big problem. I heard our invite, our former uh, Mr. Noy, Noy, I don't remember the name. I'm very concerned with this question, this question of technological challenges. The question of algorithms. Algorithms in public life, in public information. Who guarantees me that we don't have unbiased information? Who guarantees me we don't have that guarantee? Probably we have it already. And what I think with the level of functional functional illiteracy, I don't know the number here in Switzerland, but it's a question, a very important question. In the most, and I think it's incredible, we have rich countries, high educated people, they vote for populist projects. Why? There is something wrong. It's not possible. It's not the economical question. Rich people, high educated, and they adhere. They vote, they support incredible ideas. So, if when we see the level, and I like mathematics because of this, because it helps us to understand, when we see functional illiteracy rates very high, even in rich countries, people go to school, then they don't know how to use a, an ATM machine. And the question of algorithms, I ask, what can we do? Because the challenge was this, what can we do at the local level? We have to invest in human autonomy. I think that we are not investing enough in human autonomy. I think we are not preparing citizens for these challenges that we are, we are going to face it. Probably we are facing it nowadays. And we only do that if we invest, invest in more education, in humanness. We don't discuss humanness. Sometimes I'm one day listening to people, government people, they don't use once this word humanness. It's efficiency, efficiency, efficiency. And that's very dangerous. If we don't invest in humanness, if we want, you don't invest in autonomy, we are not going to be able to see the difference, to find out if it's biased or not unbiased information, and we will be controlled. It's incredible that it's true. So, what I think, I think that having different tools, it's true. We have different tools. We don't have, like you, the same tools. But lots of municipalities, Lots of men and women are paving the way to direct democracy nowadays. I see that. We see that. Uh, with, I said with participation mechanism. Learn one very important. One very, I think it's the point, the importance of the process. For me, I, I'm a local, I'm a practitioner. I'm only, I'm only, I have only nine years. It's nothing. I'm starting to understand the basics. When I listen and I say, I know everything after one year, I am scared. It's a dangerous guy. <laughs> after nine years, it's not enough. We, I'm starting to understand the basics. And the most important thing of 
democracy to stop the police, was the police. Like during democracy is the way we leave our values, the way we speak with our neighbors, the way we, we debate, we converse cover our conversations. Democracy is not only voting. And I think, just to try to finish, I think that's the most difficult thing to accept. It's a never ending job. We will never, we will never have perfect democracy. Thank you very much. Congratulations. A very important link between the local and the global aspects of democracy, which will be referred to several times in the next few days. Okay. And also from Lucerne to Balongo, something sweet to bring. Thank you very much. <laughs> That's good to know. Yeah, for wine. I really can't recommend it. I taste it. <laughs> Mayor Rivera just presented the first perspective on the topic of our forum, which leads me to ring in tonight's final with two very special guests and two very special keynotes. We start with Professor Robert Talis. It is a pleasure to have you here with us, Mr. Talis. You are a W. Alton Jones Professor of Philosophy at, and Professor of Political Science at Vanderbilt University in Nashville in Tennessee. You are also a native of, of New Jersey, by the way, like John Bon Jovi and Queen Latifa. <laughs> I don't know if you are a yeah, true. I don't know if you are a musician too, but as a philosopher, your work is focused on democracy. More specifically, you write about how a democratic political order can assist or complicate and complicate our efforts to acquire knowledge, share ideas, understand what is of value, and address our disagreements. You published two books the last few years. The one from 2019 is called Overdoing Democracy, and the one last year, Sustaining Democracy. And our co-president of the Global Forum, Joe Matthews, just read his books and was so impressed that he just invited you to present a keynote entitled, How Can We Best Sustain and Improve Democracy for the Future? Thank you. Um, Sorry. Um, thanks a lot. Um, so uh, I've been working recently in democratic theory, particularly on questions about the ethics of citizenship. There it is. Okay. This is this one here? Yeah, no, very good. Um, this is, I'm working on a, a published a two in the trilogy of books. The most um, the most recent one is called Sustaining Democracy, What We Go to the Other Side. Um, currently working on a book about the virtue of solitude and the democratic importance of um, moments of being alone. Um, I'm going to move quickly. Uh, uh, we're going to pick up uh, at the end of the talk on the question of the democratic value of solitude. Um, but for tonight, I want to move in very, very quickly in three steps. Um, I want to start for you what I think of as a moral dilemma that lies at the core of the office of democratic citizenship that I call the Democrats' dilemma. Then I want to talk about the problem of polarization. And finally, talk about um, how democracy presents a challenge uh, within us, in addition to a challenge collectively, a challenge for our institutions. So to begin, um, let's think a little bit about what democracy is. We often think about democracy as a set of institutions and practices, and it is all of that. It's very hard to make sense of why democracy is, um, is so closely associated with those institutions and practices, unless we see it as a moral ideal. Um, democracy is the moral ideal of self-government, 
among people who regard one another, one another as equals, despite the fact that they disagree about politics. Um, now, understanding democracy in that way puts political disagreement at the heart of the enterprise. There is no democracy without disagreement, and there's no democracy without disagreement about really important matters. Um, so in that way, democracy is a moral proposal. It's the idea that it's possible for us to live together as equals, despite the fact that we disagree about important values. In this way, democracy involves an ethic of citizenship. Democracy says that we must take responsibility for our political world. You can think of that sense of responsibility as vertical from the citizens to what the government is doing. Um, but we also are responsible to our fellow citizens. And what that means is that our responsibility runs horizontally. We owe one another a certain kind of treatment because as Democrats, as democratic citizens, we are equals. Now, the problem is that these two responsibilities can conflict. The vertical and horizontal senses of our responsibilities as citizens don't always play well together. Hence the Democrats' dilemma. As I was saying, we have responsibility to attempt to further justice by using our sliver of political power uh, on behalf of our best judgment about what justice demands or requires. And that responsibility for, we might say, requires us to be active participants, to be members of coalitions, to build uh, democratic alliances, and to engage in political action. But now think of the horizontal dimension of our responsibility. That is our responsibility to our fellow citizens. This involves a responsibility to regard our fellow citizens in a certain way, to treat them in ways that manifests to them our recognition that they don't merely get an equal say in a democracy, but they are entitled to an equal say in our democracy. And that usually requires what I'll call civic regard. We have to show to our fellow citizens, even when we disagree with them, a certain level of concern, regard, consultation. We might even have to talk to them, deliberate with them, share perspectives with them, those sorts of things. Now, the dilemma is that these two can pull apart. Democracy tasks us first with regarding those who are our fellow citizens as our equals, even when we see them as on the side of injustice. That is, we have to see our fellow citizens, or we are required or tasked to see our fellow citizens as our equals, even when we see them as advocating injustice. Civic regard, that is, seems to concede something to injustice. Because when we are disagreeing politically about important matters, it's very difficult. Well, we are disagreeing about very important matters. I must see those with whom I disagree as not only mistaken, but in the wrong. Not only on the wrong side of the question, but on the unjust side of the question. And often, in these in heated disagreements, hearing the other side, letting the other side make their case, extending to the other side the opportunity to reason, feels like a surrender to them feels like we're giving voice to injustice. Of course, democracy says in these cases, well, if you don't like the other side's politics, you must organize harder. In the states, uh, we say vote harder. Um, build stronger alliances, expand your coalition, build a plan for action, and so on. And that's all good democratic talk. I'm not denying that. But it raises a problem, the problem of belief polarization. Now, when we talk about polarization, we're often talking about a sociological phenomenon where two opposed sides pull apart, leaving the middle ground unoccupied, and that's where it erodes. And polarization in this popular sense is a metric of the distance between opposing sides. 
What I'm talking about, though, is belief polarization. It's a cognitive phenomenon. It's different. Belief polarization is the tendency for members of like-minded groups to become more extreme advocates, to believe more extreme versions of their shared commitments as they interact. Um, it's the tendency within a group. It's not the metric of the distance between two groups. It's a tendency within a like-minded group for members to become more extreme in their commitments, dispositions, and attitudes. As it turns out, our more extreme selves are also more insular, that is to say, negatively disposed towards perceived outsiders, more ready to dismiss opposing views, more dogmatic, in affirming our own views, more <laughs> suspicious of anyone who's not a member of the in-group, but also, and importantly, belief polarized groups become more internally conformist. That is, they become more internally hierarchical, so less internally democratic, more insistent on compliance among the in-group, among the membership, more likely to engage in risky forms of behavior on behalf of the share of the group shared ideas. In short, belief polarization is a cognitive phenomenon that encourages the stance in us that democratic relations are proper and maybe even only possible among people who are just like us. And that's a fundamentally anti-democratic thought. That's the polarization problem. In the States, people talk about polarization as if it's about the toxicity of politics and antagonism in politics. Maybe those things are problematic. The real problem of polarization is the problem that it leads us to the attitude that political disagreement is illegitimate in a democratic society. So the problem then is that the ways that we, and by the way, when I say the ways, I mean the ineliminable, the necessary ways that we take responsibility for our <laughs> politics exposes us to cognitive forces that erode our capacity to maintain our responsibility to our fellow citizens. And I think that's endemic to democratic society. I don't think polarization in the sense I've just described it is something that can be fixed or cured. It can only be managed. So managing belief polarization is essential for sustaining the moral stance that democracy requires of citizens. Now, what can we do to do that? Now, in managing or thinking about managing polarization in this the belief polarization, this cognitive sense, I think there are two errors we have to avoid that are commonly made by democracy practitioners. One error is to avoid conflating preventing polarization with curing it and managing it. A lot of depolarization strategies in democracy practitioner literature um, prescribes the following thought. Well, if polarization is the problem, let's create institutions where citizens are incentivized to interact in the ways that they would had polarization never happened. That's a mistake. Right? Fixing something is different from preventing it. I think we also have to avoid the error of construing depolarization as unity or unanimity or the absence of toxic, you know, heated disputes. I think you can't do democracy without at least the possibility of real hot political disagreement. Now, an obvious strategy for managing polarization is to figure out ways to introduce into political coalitions devil's advocacy norms, sort of John Stuart Mill kinds of thoughts about always giving voice uh, to the opposing view. I think that ship has sailed, at least in my country, it has. I think that any attempt in strong, active political coalitions to say to one's allies, well, hold on, let's consider what the opponents would say. That's a good way to be to render oneself suspect from the point of one's political allies. So we need a non-obvious strategy for managing belief polarization. Now I wanted to suggest um, 
that well, I want to remind you that belief polarization involves the intensification of negative affects towards outsiders. Mm -hmm. That's usually what people who talk about depolarization are thinking about. How do we turn the temperature down on the political disagreements? But that overlooks the fact that belief polarization is also a cognitive dynamic that encourages conformity among allies. But I want to suggest to you that one, I think, underexplored depolarization technique or tactic would be to focus on easing the conformity pressures within coalitions and hoping that with those pressures eased, some of the negative affects and extremism in the face of the opponent might take care of itself. Well, once we see that the problem is internal conformity, we see then that <laughs> one way to address or manage polarization is to invent strategies, practice techniques for expanding our conception of permissible disagreement among our allies. That's the crucial thought. To see that there's a acceptable range of variation among our allies' doctrines and commitments and beliefs, that we can be allies without agreeing about all of the fine details of our shared views. However, given that group dynamics are already in place that make this a very, very difficult task to achieve, I think the process can't begin with, you know, showing up at uh, the next meeting of your political group and saying, hey, why don't we you know, explore our disagreements? Again, I think this is a way to render yourself suspect, suspect among your political allies. So I want to suggest that given that the group dynamics for global belief polarization are already in place, the process for sustaining democracy has to begin within ourselves. That is, the task of managing polarization is essentially that task of exercising our reflective capacities, our imaginative capacities, in contexts that are free of the pressure to conform with our allies. And I want to suggest to you that in my country and in a lot of other contemporary democracies, these strategies can be practiced or best practiced in solitude. That is, the suggestion is for depolarization, we need to gain distance, or at least we need on occasion to gain distance from our allies and our opponents alike. We also need distance from the fray of current political travails. We need to expand our political imaginations to think of a future that's not captive to existing political fissures and frays. We need occasions to remind ourselves that democracy is not always about us right here and right now. To get a feel of what I'm after, ask yourself, and here's where I'll end. What does democracy look like? You Google the phrase, what does democracy look like? You'll get hundreds of thousands of photos of what's on the left of the screen. It's, it's eerie how common the pictures are. They're all the same thing. And democracy is that. I'm not, I'm not asking you to give up that point. But we've been too quick to adopt the idea that civic activities, that democratic participation must be collective and public. A lot of it is, of course, but not all of it. Democratic citizens must be active in the way that they are on the left-hand side of the screen. But they also need to be thoughtful and reflective. And belief polarization shows that essential modes of democratic participation expose us to cognitive forces that erode our capacity for reflection. Thus, we need to think that what's going on on the right slide, a person sitting alone in a library reading a book, who knows what book it is, thinking about what he's reading, that that too is a civic activity. We tend to associate reflection and solitude with the luxurious retreat from civic life. But that's an error. The proposal that I'm making is not that we need to occasionally withdraw from politics but that we need to think about democracy in a way that enables us to recognize that there are crucial forms of civic activity that we can only perform when we're alone. Thank you.
Containing democracy at task within us, we surely take it as our mission, and your mission is to taste our gift from the sermon. <laughs> the second keynote is coming from someone who experienced directly how it is when democratic freedoms just fall apart or are in danger. It is an honor to have you here with us, Tefkir Musayeva. Tefkir Musayeva is an Ukrainian journalist and editor in chief of the Ukrainska Pravda, established in the year 2000. Tefkir Musayeva, he grew up on Crimea in southern Ukraine and studied journalism at Kiev University. During the years of democratization in the early 2010 years, he worked with and founded um, a host of media hubs to cover the developments. Then you had to flee from Crimea after the Russian occupation in 2014. Today, you are leading a publication which reaches more than 4 million, million people a day. This year, the Time magazine named Sefkir Mosayeva as one of the most influential people in 2022. Today, she is here with us. Sefkir, stage is yours. Good evening all. I know that it's already nine o'clock, so I'll be very short. So I will start. I was born in a country that no longer existed, and thanks God. The Soviet Union was a superpower by 300 million people. It was second in the world in industrial production and was very proud that the first human to go in outer space was Soviet cosmonaut Yuri Gagarin. And this is the part of the truth in which my parents lived. The second part of the Soviet Union existed under conditions of strict censorship. There were no human rights, 300 million people lived behind iron curtain. Uh, the idea of life in Western countries uh, drew from the Soviet newspapers the names of which called Pravda, and Pravda means truth, and the embedded and ship of Ukraine, Pravda, which means Ukrainian truth. The Soviet Union created its own tools from newspapers, readers could learn about the achievements of the Empire and how badly, badly people live in the United States of America. And the newspaper Pravda, like the rest of the most leaders of the Soviet Union, kept silent about something of Hitler's hostile regime. And according uh, to the historian during his reign, um, more than 30 years, three and a half million people um, were repressed and 45,000 people. Well, good. By the order of Stalin, a year uh, before the end of the Second World War, May 1944, all the representatives of my nation, Crimea Data, were deported from their native land, and they were accused of cooperating with the device. So Stalin expelled more than 200,000 people, among them were children and women, and all them was my grandmother and her brothers, actually. And for more than 50 years, many and others were forbidden to leave and even to travel to Crimea. Uh, so, and they were also not mentioned in Soviet history books and uh, even in newspapers. Actually, they were able to return homeland in, in the early 90s uh, during the collapse of the Soviet Union. And then it was just two and a half years old when we moved to the family from Uzbekistan to Crimea. And I never could imagine that um, uh, in 25 years, my family first, first to leave Crimea yeah, again. Uh, when Russia occupied Crimea in 2014, the Russian, uh, the Russian media lied that the Ukrainian fascists who had come to power the Kiev were preparing provocations in Crimea. So Russian televisions use the same rhetoric uh, to fuel the conflict in Eastern Ukraine. Unfortunately, they were successful. I became chief editor of the Pravda in 2014. I was 27 years old. And uh, of course, it was terrible timing. War in Eastern Ukraine, my native land occupied, uh, some of my relatives already are 
from the repressions in Crimea, my family forced to leave Crimea because the same reason actually secured the reason. Uh, but it turns out all these terrible events were just preparation uh, for the most important battle for the right of our country to exist, uh, which um, started for us on the morning of February 24th, 2020. We already um, wait, 21st of September will be the seven months of the war in Ukraine for the war. And every day it takes life of people, it destroys our destinies, our cities, it steals our future because you can just uh, think about it. Just the future disappears. You can just plan every single day, but not think about the future. And not as important in the for example, even in months. And uh, I remember on the first day of war, with panic and fear, uh, raining all around, I asked my, myself only one question What can I do and what would be my role during this war? What, how can I help my people? And then I asked that the answer to these questions, uh, these questions had already been by my question because I'm a journalist, and journalists are doing. Uh, or time time war uh, has a special meaning. And I remember the, the first days of Putin and invasion when people were afraid to be sleep without news. And I know how panic can work and how easily people can be manipulated. For example, in the beginning of war, I remember it was the sixth day of war, I received a call from my friend in Mariupol that was already occupied by Russian forces and he asked me only one question. It's true that Kiev has already been surrendered. So, and he cried, and I was trying to explain, no, 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 it's not true. Uh, it was they don't have a source of information, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. uh, in the early days of the war, I had one task and one concern. But it was impossible to ensure that people received news at every single moment, every single second. I remember that. Um, and we updated our news every single three minutes, uh, most week of the day. So you can imagine that every single three minutes, something appeared in our lives. Uh, already mentioned that now our audience is reach out to million people, but first days of the war, it was around, it was around like seven million people, and we have second left side in other country after the war, which is, you know, I never can imagine. So. But um, I want to um, tell you more about Jackie Rice, why Jackie Rice is the editor in chief as a person for this terrible seven months of war. We must people who not harm and lose also. Uh, we must people. In the, few, uh, in the first few days of the war, I wrote one simple message in my Facebook, and this uh, simple message was all right. What, what is happening with you in your cities? And people responded. There were hundred thousand responses, uh, and uh, they, were, they were trying to explain what was going on. And it's not not only supported them in time of crisis and time of need, but also helped us to pay attention to important and critical points in different regions. Because one time was so big, like in different cities, and you can't have a little. And um, some of these people still write me um, directly, and uh, some of them leave and stay in occupied territories, and they only want source information for us and for all world about what's going on in occupied territories. Do not harm. In the war, in the state of can cost of human life, and uh, uh, I know what I'm talking about. Um, Every day you encounter human tragedy, uh, pain, and grief, um, and ethics is more important than ever. Uh, from victims, if you refuse to publish their stories, and you can just accept. Uh, for example, in the beginning of war, not in the beginning of when just city, but when the region was objectified, I received a request from uh, one of uh, victims of sexual violence and she asked me on. Um, just to help go and um, the hospital with the medicines against the medicines or abortion. Um, 
I help them, of course, uh, and I ask them, maybe you are ready to tell the story and to tell the truth about what happened with the project, and they will not I didn't know that because you, you need to have this um, ethics. Truth helps you be. Um, uh, for me, this war, it's not only war about, uh, it's not only anti colonial war, it's not a uh, war for the future, but for democracy, it's also. The war between truths and lies and the uh, world just to call spade a state. And um, it's not like a conflict, it's war, it's not a special operation. How Putin, for example, is playing a conflict. Um, you have to use um, the correct word. And thanks to journalists, of also the truth about um, a lot of Ukrainian cities. Um, you mentioned before Bucha, but unfortunately, this week. On Savannah more city, added to this list. Unfortunately, it's a city of the Zoom. Already, we found a Ukrainian soil was found, a mass place with 400 people, uh, tortured people. Uh, and of course, um, Russia blames the West. Russia said that, okay, Bucha is staged, okay, uh, news, etc. But um, we know the truth. We know the truth because, for example, in Bucha, uh, Russian soldiers killed unarmed um, father of my colleague, a uh, 70 years old man. He was just a villain and then he killed Turkey. And in the European, I uh, lost my classmate, Konkavat, uh, ruined the uh, painter and went to He came. Ukraine to film um, a documentary about refugees in Ukraine. And uh, unfortunately, he was killed by Russian soldiers in Ukraine on the 13th of March. And I want to say that already we have 39 journalists in Ukraine, more than, um, more than ever. So nobody can imagine such um, numbers of victims among journalists. Uh, um, some of them were my friends. Um, um, some of them decided to go to the front line, and even in our front and in our newsroom. We have two uh, journalists, brilliant uh, journalists. They decided that they will be more useful for the country, not as a journalist, but uh, as a military guys. They decided to uh, leave our newsroom, unfortunately. And you know this question and this discussion uh, about um, citizen and journalists you have uh, every single day. And for me, it's also a um, very important question. And uh, during this seven months of war, we published a lot, a lot of stories about Russian oligarchs. We published a list of 150,000 uh, Russian soldiers uh, when they were just a few kilometers away from all our relatives and from our houses. Uh, we published um, uh, stories about uh, war crimes, but we also published um, uh, critical articles about Ukrainian authorities, and we were very criticized by that. Uh, even on cover politics, we have the discussion is it uh, time, is it good time to cover all aspects of this war? And of course, I said yes. Because uh, freedom of speech uh, is one of the most important matters of democracy. And uh, I hope I'm wonderful to come in my life. Um, but I want to maybe end my uh, speech uh, with this example. Father uh, Akhija, former editor of editor in chief of The Guardian, who was my also tutor, uh, wrote a sense of journalism um, in, in 2000. Well, if I'm not mistaken, they investigated the case of John Snowden. And of course, this case was also criticized by British authorities. And um, uh, British Parliament decided that just to invite uh, Alan Rasputin to come to the Parliament and uh, to answer a lot of, a lot of questions. To, to, uh, what, uh, a lot of questions they had for them. And one of the questions of the Member of Parliament was uh, to rule out your country. And the, the answer of Alan was, of course, I love my country and uh, um, my country is democracy, and I will protect um, one of the main uh, values of this democracy, freedom of speech. 
And for me, as a good journalist, because um, <coughs> editor in chief of Ukrainska Pravda, and actually the meaning of Ukrainska Pravda, um, my, I started my speech with um, describing um, truth and describing Pravda as a Soviet newspaper. Um, in 2000, um, Ukrainska Pravda was created by two prominent uh, Ukrainian journalists, and one of uh, the journalists was killed. His name was Georgi Dangansa, and on 16th of September, his memory day, 22 years ago, ago, he was killed by Ukrainian authorities and Ukrainian policy, policy men. And uh, when the Gaza decided to create Ukrainska Pravda, um, he gave this name Ukrainska Pravda because um, the world Pravda had extremely negative connotation during these times in Ukraine. And he decided to give new meanings to old concepts. And I think it's very important. And it's all about uh, Ukraine now. Um, and, you know, my country fights every single day for the right to exist. And this is a essential war. I understand that um, it's hard to believe that such a brutal war can take, uh, can, can be in Europe right now. But, uh, I want to say one important uh, thing why I today had an incredible discussion with Joel Nurkari and uh, Neil Gaiman about future. And uh, all two of them told me today that of course Ukraine will win this war because uh, future always defeats uh, the past. And uh, Ukraine fights for not only for its own future, but uh, future for democracy and all uh, free world. Thank you all. Eva, sharing your experience, we wish you a lot of energy and it's very challenging time for you. Thank you. I often read that um, our brain is setting together the pieces we collect during the days, uh, during the night when it's leading to a whole picture. So I am convinced the footprints we collected today and this evening um, will, will be saved as a powerful map to new ideas on how we can develop and sustain democracy in the future. It was a very, very rich opening this evening, rich due to our very esteemed speakers, but also rich because of you, you the listeners. Thank you very much for listening. Listening is almost finished for today. I'm looking forward, forward to starting the birth tomorrow with you all. And what is left to me now is hand, handing over the words to Afyan and Carly. He will present some closing words and an overlook for today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It's not a big program tomorrow, but just I would, I would like to ask you what's the most interesting, interesting thing for you? What are you looking for tomorrow? Just a short answer. Um, yeah, it's a very full cool program. It's uh, 50, over 50 pages. I've been in contact with many of you organizing sessions. Um, and I think what our, our two keynote speakers today, I'd really like to thank you for that. We drove home as a sort of like necessity of, of why we need this conversation now, because we're we're facing challenges, um, we're facing more, we're facing polarization that, that we um, that we haven't faced in in a long time, or, or maybe ever. Um, also, climate change, will, which will be a topic that will really spotlight um, at this forum. And so, uh, one of my my personal favorites in the program is a workshop uh, tomorrow morning, uh, where we look at democracy under threat, uh, and we have, where we will talk with um, activists from different countries um, about their lived experience and how we can um, how we can work together as civil society um, to. Um, to, to make something better, so that you look at the future. So that is okay. what I will be joining. Great, thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, for me, um, I will quote uh, in uh, my mother language, and I möchte gerne in Schweizer 
äh, nicht Schweizer Deutsch, aber doch in Deutschland beenden. Äh, für mich gibt es einen Ort in Luzern, der ganz, ganz speziell ist. Sie haben alle diesen Ort im, am Ende äh, Ihres Programms, ist das Würden Denkmal konkret in Luzern. Und ich möchte sagen, die Schweiz war ja nie ein Königreich, aber es gab immer sogenannte Schweizer Könige. Es gab Schweizer Schweizer Könige konkret auch, die diese Ludwig und Victor von Augen besuchen, die haben diese Zeit vor 500 Jahren geprägt. Das war der Kampf der Aristokratie gegen auch die neuen Fortschritte. Die Kräfte ich kann nicht im Detail gehen, aber es ist eine spannende Zeit, 1798 aus der Zuführung in dieser französischen Revolution, die auch die Schweiz erreichte, dass hier diese helvetische Revolution ist. 1798, nein, da möchte ich sich daran erinnern, wo die Luzern Hauptstadt verschwand. Ganz kurze Zeit davor war Aarau, wo unsere Nationalratspräsidentin hier stand. Aber Luzern war in dieser revolutionären Zeit einen kurzen Moment auch die Hauptstadt der Schweiz, das dauert ja nicht lang. Die reaktionären Kräfte haben sich wieder durchgesetzt. Und morgen wollen wir eigentlich eben auch den Stimmen gegen den jungen Menschen, ich möchte Sie alle ganz herzlich einladen, am Sonntag, Eben die Theater Kids, konkret auf französische Revolution und Löhne Denkmal. Was ist die Geschichte des Löhne Denkmals? Was können wir daraus lernen? Ist es ein Relikt auch quasi dieser Verwendung der Schweiz in Kriege konkret gegen das Volk, verteidigen den König? 4000 Schweizer starben, sie wurden verkauft an ausländische Mächte. Die Schweiz hat profitiert davon, dass die Menschen aus der Schweiz verteilt wurden, damit auch dann schlussendlich der Erlöse regeneriert wurde, während heute Touristen zu uns kommen und quasi auch das mitfinanzieren. Also die Leidens, äh, die Schulen, die Theaterkids gekämpft wie ein Löwe, ist vielleicht auch ein Motto, um das Globoforum heute zu schließen. Aber ich möchte noch mit einem zweiten Anliegen, Salina Globo hat dazu auch aufgerufen, ich bin glücklich, dass wir am Freitag einen Workshop anbieten, konkret auch. Wir haben hier diese Wanderurne, damit wurden früher die Stimmen in den Altersheimen gesammelt und die Partei, die am stärksten konkret auch Wanderurnen dann jeweils begleiten konnte, die hat dann schlussendlich nahezu die Wahlen gewonnen. Das wurde heute demokratisiert. Ich will damit nur sagen, dass die Demokratie ist ein never ending Prozess. Die Demokratie muss sich weiterentwickeln, damit die muss sich verteidigen, stärken. Und ich möchte wirklich auch darauf hinweisen, nochmal konkret auf diesen Anlass, den jungen Menschen eine Stimme zu geben, wie wir das heute aus Salinas Global gehen, geben konnten. Das ist mir ein großes Anliegen, ein großes Anliegen, möchte ich aber auch an Beatrix, den Stadtpräsidenten von hier, von Luzern, von meiner Heimatstadt. Es ist eine Einladung, was wir heute begonnen haben, weiterzuführen. Ich wünschte mir, Beat, eine Stadt des Dialoges, mit der quasi die Menschen zusammenbringt, wie wir heute sechs verschiedene Parteipräsidenten, also Parlamentspräsidentinnen und Präsidenten, als sechs Parteien zusammenbringen. Das Ziel ist doch quasi, dass wir uns gemeinsam stärken, dass wir unsere Ideale, die heute so unterschiedlich, aber auch so vielfältig und so stark dargestellt wurden, dass wir die weiter verteidigen und kämpfen können. Damit schließe ich. Meine geschätzten Freunde, Demokratiefreunde, weltweit hat 51 Jahre. Es wird morgen früh um 8 Uhr mit der Registrierung, konkret im Neubad. Neubad, das ist das frühere Hallenbad der Stadt Luzern. Wir werden also in einem Swimmingpool tagen. Es ist etwas Einzigartiges, das also auch zu verteidigen ein Ort, das ein Landes ist. Ich sage toi, 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 schönen guten Abend, alles Gute. Wir sehen uns morgen um 9 Uhr in Neubad. Thank <laughs> you.